I'm going to pick up today where I left off in the last study. Daniel is seeing a panoramic out of order view of future events. The timeline I gave you a couple of studies back will be helpful as we go through the remainder of the book. We're told in uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy, I believe it is, 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In the last study, we saw a lot of different things happening, but not much information about any of them. It was just this big panoramic view, like I said, and that's why we have to study the whole Bible, put the rightly divided pieces together that we find, compare Scripture with Scripture, see how they correspond with each other. And uh, I will remind you once again, do not let my studies or anyone else's study take the place of your own study of reading God's Word for yourself. Nothing should take the place of you spending time at the feet of Jesus, learning directly from Him. So in the last study, we talked about the Great White Throne judgment. I told you that happens at the end of the millennial reign. Daniel 7, 9 through 11 is the Great White Throne judgment and earth being purified with fire while that's taking place and Satan cast into the flames. So there are many hundreds of verses in the Bible about each topic. I'm mostly just giving you a few as we come to them and maybe one or two to compare with them. I don't remember if I gave you Revelation 11 verses 17 through 18 last time, but the two words of verse 17 hast reigned shows that the great white throne judgment of verse 18 comes after the 1000 year reign. The other thing we looked at in the last study was the judgment of the nations which happens at the end of the tribulation. Verse 12 speaks of the judgment of the nations in Daniel 7. Since I've already done a few lessons on chapter 7 and 8, uh, I thought I would try to finish them today, but as I'm looking back over, I don't know if I'll ever finish them. <laughs> I hope so. I think I'm wearing out my welcome here in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. But anyway, we um, saw Antichrist rising to power which happens during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. So he rose up as that little horn out of the nations during the first half of the trib. He's not known as Antichrist during the first three and a half years. He's only known as one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. He'll be a genius who comes in peaceably, takes the world by storm. He's going to take it by flatteries and speaking peace, peace, peace. More of his characteristics are seen in Daniel 11 and in all the types we've seen of Antichrist throughout the Bible. He's seen in the characteristics of Pharaoh, of Nimrod, of Sennacherib, of Nebuchadnezzar, of many, many more. And we see him especially in the book of Daniel um, in Antioch, Antioch, Antichus Epiphanes and in the uh, history books that have been written about Antichus. In Daniel's um, writings, when we look at the same scriptures that people back in ancient times looked at, we can see all of these people and get a picture of Antichrist and what he's going to be like. God wrote that way. He speaks to us all from the beginning to the end. Every person in every life situation can pick up the Bible and get an answer from it, a word from it that was written especially for them, to them for that time, although it's written for everyone throughout the ages. It's an amazing, an amazing book. Antichus was used by Satan to do his evil deeds. The Antichrist will be Satan in the flesh doing his evil deeds. Those living 200 to 230 years after Daniel could, uh, could see Antichus as that little horn. They had no need to see the Antichrist back then. They 
are not, they weren't living in the latter days as we now are. So, um, and as those who may be living right now to go through the tribulation. So when they look at it, when we look at it, we're going to see the Antichrist in the characteristics of these things being mentioned in the book of Daniel. When the question was asked by the disciples about when the end would be, Jesus answered in Matthew twenty four fifteen, When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Jesus wasn't talking to the Jews who lived way back in Daniel's day that saw the abomination of desolation committed by Antichus when he uh, offered a pig on the Jewish altar. Those Jews died a long time ago. Jesus is warning future Jewish people who may be living during the tribulation time about Antichrist and the abomination he will commit. So there are double applications, even triple applications in many, many scriptures we read of throughout the Bible. We just got to look at the context and look at scriptures in the rest of the Bible and figure out what he's talking about. So Daniel 8, 9 says, The little horn waxed exceeding great. As the tribulation goes on, Antichrist becomes more and more powerful above all the other nations and above all the other leaders of the world. Most all of Daniel 11 is about Antichrist Epiphanes and the Syrian wars. But as the chapter progresses, we see the Antichrist too. Daniel eleven twenty one says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, a morally despicable person, just the kind of person the lost ones left behind after the rapture will love, just the kind of person the world loves today, a morally despicable person because he's like them. He shall come in peaceably and take the world by flatteries. Uh, chapter 8, verse 25 says, By peace shall destroy many. Daniel eight twenty three through 24, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Antichrist will be a genius who will be able to give answers to all the hard questions. He will be fierce so that no other country can stand against him. He'll be a genius who will know how to handle them and he'll solve all the world's problems. Everyone will love him at first. Some will even think he's their Messiah. But in the second half of the tribulation, he will be deadly fierce to all who oppose him. Daniel eight twenty four says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. His power is going to come from Satan. Antichrist will come on the scene as a person the world will love. They'll love his lack of morals because he'll be like them. He'll flatter everyone, nations and individuals. He will come in at a time when utter chaos is happening in the streets and in world affairs. It will be after the rapture of the church. And oh my goodness, if you thought the riots were horrible, back during the summer when all that stuff was going on and people were breaking into stores and rioting. The police couldn't do nothing. If you think that was bad, just wait till after the rapture and uh, a lot of people are going to be missing. So <laughs> there's going to be a lot of stuff to be had. It's going to be total chaos. So then there's going to be a peace covenant made with Israel. And this is going to happen sometime near the beginning of the tribulation. And I'll talk more about that when we get to Daniel chapter 9. But something of it is mentioned in Daniel 8 verses 1 through 14 concerning the breaking of the covenant. Daniel 9 27 tells us that uh, Antichrist is going to make some kind of peace peace treaty, some kind of covenant with Israel that he'll break 
in the middle of the tribulation. It's thought that this will be some kind of um, agreement so that Israel will be able to rebuild their temple and resume having their sacrifices. Since we do see that happening in the book of Daniel and Revelation and other places, we know that some kind of agreement has to be made or else that would never happen since the Muslim's Dome of the Rock is now sitting on Israel's third temple site. So peace in the Middle East between these Muslim countries and Israel, that would be uh, the most awesome achievement for any political leader. And at the first of the tribulation, somehow or another, the Antichrist is going to do that. Israel has been a burdensome stone, a cup of trembling, the Bible tells us, for all the nations for a long, long time. Everybody's after that little bitty, bitty piece of dirt. <laughs> when Antichrist first appears, he, he's, like I said, going to be so wonderful, so loved that everyone will think, oh, this is the Messiah. He has brought in the kingdom age, especially after he receives a deadly head wound and is brought back to life. And this will happen midway in the middle of the tribulation. Daniel 8 verses 9 through 10 says, The little horn waxed exceeding great. This great leader gets a deadly uh, head wound. Revelation 13 3 says, One of the dragon's heads was wounded to death and the deadly wound was healed. We've learned already the dragon is Satan from Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 13, 14 says he had the wound by a sword and did live. So the wound will be by a sword. Zechariah eleven seventeen says the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, people would normally think uh, a, 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 an attempted assassination by a, a gun. Assassins usually use guns, right? But think about it. <laughs> In the last few years, we've heard of people using swords or some kind of something to cut other people's heads off. So it's going to be a sword. The Bible says it's going to be a sword. <clears throat> but he's going to come back to life. At the same time, Antichrist, dead body, lies in state somewhere with all the world mourning after him. Stuff's going to be taking place up in the heavenlies. Satan is going to be cast down to earth at the same time in the middle of the tribulation. And uh, we saw that in several scriptures I gave you to compare with Daniel 8.10. So Satan will be cast out of his heavenly headquarters along with his angels. In Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, There was war in heaven. Satan, who deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 12, Woe to the inhabitants of earth! The devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The corresponding verse to this from Daniel 8 is verse 10, speaking of the little horn is Antichrist, the verse says, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. Satan will then fully indwell this dead body of flesh of the Antichrist and bring him back to life. He will be resurrected as a counterfeit Messiah. And the ministry of Jesus on earth was three and a half years. Satan's also will be three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Not only will there be a resurrection, he's going to come up doing powerful signs and wonders, and many of those who would not receive the truth when they had the chance will receive this lie. They will receive him. For many who weren't already convinced that he's the Messiah, this will do it. They will believe this lie. 
Revelation 13 shows that Satan will also counterfeit the Trinity of God, God the Father with um, his unholy Trinity. The dragon will be in the place of Satan, the father. The beast is Antichrist, as Satan, the son, and the false prophet as Satan, the Holy Spirit. Why, why, why would God allow a counterfeit resurrection and wonders and miracles to happen so that some would believe a lie? Why would God allow this to happen? Well, we can't know all the answers, but some things we can see. For about 6,000 years now, he's given the world time to accept him or Satan. He gave people freedom of choice to accept God or Satan as their God. Those left behind after the rapture of the church have chosen to believe a lie. They wanted to believe a lie all their life. They did not want the authority of a good, good father. They refused Jesus and chose Satan. God is giving them what they always wanted. But they'll still be free to choose. And they can still be saved during the tribulation. They can still be saved. God's not going to make them choose to follow Satan. In 2 Thessalonians 2.9, it does say God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Many will, but there will be many still getting saved. 2 Thessalonians 2.3-11 3 says, Let no man deceive you. Did you get that? Everyone is responsible to read for ourselves and ask God to reveal his word to us so that we are not deceived. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." who opposeth, and listen to this, this goes along with the abomination of desolation, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withhold holdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And it goes on to say that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Satan's already working. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked, talking about Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's going to be further on in the end. Uh, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And it goes on to say that with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There's going to be many delusions during the tribulation time, many signs and wonders, but they're not all going to be done strictly by the, the bad side. There's going to be uh, some signs and wonders done by the uh, 144,000 missionaries who are going everywhere preaching, but that's for another time. Okay. <laughs> So we see Satan at work today, but once the church is removed, God's going to let him have at it for a while, and those who are left behind are going to fall so much for his lies, and God will not only allow it, uh, he's going to give his permission for it to be so. There are instances that shows us God has done that before. Let's look at Second Chronicles 18 and 1 Kings 22. These supplement each other. And I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. Okay. Ahab, king of Israel, and King Jehoshaphat of Judah were discussing the affairs of their world one day. And Ahab said, um, he asked him, he said, um, 
how about sending an army with me to defeat the Syrians? And King Jehoshaphat of Judah said, sure, but first let's ask the Lord what he'd have us do. So Ahab brought in 400 heathen lying prophets and asked them, should we attack or not? They said, yeah, go ahead. The Lord will help you. One of them named Zedekiah made some horns of iron and he must have uh, he must have been using them to demonstrate how to beat the Syrians. I can imagine him running around everywhere, pushing it at the others with his iron horn saying, yeah, yeah, we'll push them like this. Yeah, push them and you'll win. All the others were yelling, yeah, go, go, you'll prosper. God will deliver you. No doubt they were acting like a bunch of heathen. So King Jehoshaphat of Judah recognized them as such and said, Isn't there a prophet of the Lord here that we could ask? Well, Ahab had one locked up in prison. Ahab said, Well, yeah, there's Micaiah, but I hate him because he never says anything good about me, only evil. But Ahab went ahead and sent for him. And the servant who brought him before the kings told Micaiah what the false prophets were saying. And he emphasized that they all were saying the same thing and advised him to say the same thing. He said, because that's what the kings want to hear. So do you see by this that even if 400 teachers or preachers or priests are saying the same thing, if the whole world is saying the same thing, you better check God's word. Because if it disagrees with God, God's word, then it's the wrong thing. And we'll see that. God in 1 Kings 20 and 21 had already pronounced a death sentence upon Ahab because of his wickedness, but had given him more opportunities to repent. Since Ahab continued to prefer the lies of the false prophets over the truth given by God's prophet, God used false prophets and they spoke the lies Ahab wanted to hear. First Kings 22 and Second Chronicles 18 is very enlightening as to how the Lord operates and as such gives us a little view into the spirit world. And as I've told y'all before, God does have a sense of humor and many of God's prophets did too. The servant who brought Micaiah in before the kings told him that all the false prophets were saying the same thing. He emphasized all of them, told Micaiah, that's what you need to do. That's what they want to hear. And so in Second Chronicles eighteen thirteen, Micaiah told the servant, he said, What my God saith, that will I speak. Well, here we go. He was taken to the kings, and the scene before him must have been so comical to him with the false prophets running around with the horns and all 400 saying, go up, go up. The Lord will deliver you. You'll have victory. Sometimes you just got to laugh. <laughs> so I believe Micaiah joined in the fun when the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to battle or not? Micaiah said to him, sure, go ye up and prosper and they shall be delivered into your hand. <laughs> Ahab knew Micaiah was being sarcastic and making fun of the situation. And the king said to him, how many times do I have to tell you to just tell me the truth? And here was Ahab saying, tell me the truth. He didn't really want the truth. <laughs> so in the next verse, 1 Kings and in Second Chronicles, Micaiah tells him the truth. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. They have no master is indicating that Ahab is going to die in that battle. At that point, King Ahab turned to King Jehoshaphat and said, Didn't I tell you that he would not prophesy anything good about me? Only evil. <laughs> and his next words is where I'm going with this story concerning God allowing Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet to get away with the resurrection and the signs and wonders they'll be doing during the tribulation. Listen to what Micaiah says next. 1 Kings 22, starting at verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, 
who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Did you see that? God put a lying spirit in the mouth of these 400 false prophets and then allowed Micaiah to tell the kings that he did that, that that's what was happening. God was responsible. Micaiah told them the truth. They know Micaiah was a true prophet of God, but still, still they go on in their own way and do what they want to do. There are a lot of people today who know the whole truth but still refuse to follow Jesus. Pharaoh knew the whole truth. The Bible says God hardened his heart. God just kind of twisted that heart of Pharaoh so what was really deep down in it just came on out. Uh, That's what God is allowing to be done here. He is allowing the people to follow the lies they've always wanted to follow. But still, they have a choice. God chose to use the lying spirit because Ahab rejected God's rebukes and warnings all through his life. God gave him chance after chance, and finally the cup of God's wrath was full, like it will be during the tribulation, which is known as the day of God's wrath. God is in control over all creation and not restricted in what or whom he can use to accomplish his purposes. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? Daniel 4.35 He sets up kings and he removes kings. And God is ultimately in control, and that's good news for the Christian. We know Ahab knows Micaiah is God's prophet, and he knows he's telling the truth, but he thinks he can outsmart God by going to battle in a disguise. You can read the rest of the story for yourself, but I'll tell uh, tell you what God determines will happen And it did happen, just as Micaiah had told them, Israel went home from that battle without a king. Ezekiel 14, 4 through 5 is a cross-reference that you should see along with Deuteronomy. Um, I didn't write down my... (laughs) I didn't write down the address for Deuteronomy. I'm sorry. But about false prophets is what that's about. And these passages show that if the Word of God is contradicted in any way, by what anybody says, no matter how many are saying the same thing, you better just stick with what the written Word of God says. During the tribulation, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And it it tells us to let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. When Antichrist is resurrected after having that head wound, this is when the horror show begins. This is the beginning of what is called the Great Tribulation. It's going to be bad before that, but you ain't seen nothing yet. And thankfully, the Christian will be gone. So I'm going to stop there today and let you think about that a while. And I hope you're reading on through the book of Daniel and... Uh, it's a very exciting book, a very moving book, and it it shows us things past history has happened so we know the future history that is prophesied will happen just as well. And I hope that you know Jesus as your Savior. I hope and pray you won't be here for that horrible, horrible time. 
Being saved and knowing you have a home in heaven is as simple as believing that Jesus came, he lived, he died to pay the price for your sin and mine. And by turning to him in belief as the one who did that, you can be saved. It is as simple as saying, Lord, I believe. Lord, I take you as my Savior now. Won't you do that? God bless you.